I'm Lynn Manuel Miranda, and you're listening to Hard Knock Life. Welcome to Hard Knock Life. I'm Keith Chow. I am joined by a very special guest, someone who wasn't necessarily in the room where it happened, but he was down the street. He is the author, co-author of Rise and the forthcoming Golden Screen, which I think he's got to go like rewrite real quick because we got to talk about everything everywhere all at once. Please welcome my friend and collaborator and partner, Jeff Yang. Hello, Keith. Hello, all you who are listening out there on this very, very happy, very different world kind of a day. It's like we've sort of verse jumped into a new reality. And I'm still, I have to say, I've still got the glow on me. (laughs) It is an Asian American holiday, I think, going forward. (laughs) March 12th, March 13th, whatever the the day is when when they actually won the award. So burying the lead, last night was the Oscars. Everything, everywhere, all at once. The the film that everyone's been talking about for a year exactly now walked away batting seven hundred. They had ten nominations, one seven, the most awarded motion picture, best picture ever, which is which is nuts. Three acting <laughs> wins, which is unprecedented. The Daniels won three times last night, right? I feel like the number of Asian Americans who won Oscars just last night probably equals the total amount of Asian American winners like in the history of the 95 years of the Oscar. probably exceeds frankly <laughs> maybe yeah right right we've got to do the math later but Jeff as as you were there at the Marshall Club watching on the big screen having the uh the Oscar party that they put on what was it like first of all what was it like being around like an audience because you know I was in my pajamas watching in my in my living room you know what I mean like what was it like being in a, in a room full of people not at the Kodak, but like I said, down the street, reacting to to all the times that Daniel's name got called, and, and especially Key and Michelle. Well, I got to say, uh, the evening started out early on the highest possible note in a lot of ways, because when Key got his flowers, this room, uh, you could not have, you couldn't hear your own thoughts. It was just so crazy, because out of all the people in the cast, as much as we all needed to see Michelle win, obviously wanted Daniels to win everything. Key is the guy who, throughout this whole process, just like in the movie itself, right? He could not have been more humble, more optimistic, more good-natured. He could not have been more karmically, in a lot of ways, set up for victory, right? And yet we all know, as Asian Americans, how frequently the storyline that we expect and project the hopes that we have get dashed there's just so many ways in which the gap between our our dreams and the realities that occur later uh, end up being more like evelyn right so the fact that he kicked things off with with his victory in a lot of ways i mean everybody in the room could not have been more ecstatic and more ecstatic specifically for him, right? Well, and there's also like a, a multiverse in which EEAOO was not the the juggernaut that it ultimately became. And, and no mm. one predicted the jug like we joked a year ago like oh, you know, everyone get ready for the Oscars. But no you, you know, we <laughs> we've been disappointed enough times in our in our lives to not hope for like what happened last night. But there is a world in which he would have still been like the lone representative of, yeah. right? Like if Key had lost, it would have been like, oh, you know, like flipping tables and stuff like that, right? Like he was <laughs> the one surefire winner going into the award ceremony last night. I mean, yeah, you, 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 you know. As Which is say, wild in itself, yeah. right? Uh, well, I mean, of course, the Oscars love a story and, and there's no, in some ways, better story than Key's in the sense that, Yes, when somebody gets essentially locked out of Hollywood for three decades, for them to come back and be presented with an award like this, there's something beautiful about it. But frankly, if that had happened, my my reaction would have been very happy and proud for him and of him, and also really pissed as hell because it's there's that would have felt like a consolation prize. Yeah. And moreover, that would have felt like a consolation prize that the Oscars give gave to themselves right the right. industry patting themselves on the back for bringing the guy back and not saying oh well you know 
he's been around this whole time. We've kind of ignored him, but that's all right. We're, we're celebrating him now, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I think that there's, there's a sense in which that would have been actually more disappointment than, than celebration, at least broadly speaking. In terms of, of the, the impact on the culture, if you want to say the big C culture, right? The very fact that we went into this thinking that for all of our hopes, dreams, and sort of whimsical wishes, this was impossible, underscores the degree to which we are, as I actually wrote about in the Washington Post, subject to a kind of learned helplessness as Asian Americans. And we have been happy to kind of catch crumbs, right, here and there. You know, even even the moments of Parasite's amazing wins a couple of years ago, well, you know, that was something that was truly precious to us. But at the same time, it is a movie out of Asia. And the the particulars, the dynamics of that are different. I, I think Bong actually said it best when he defined the Oscars, maybe a little bit tongue in cheek, as a regional awards ceremony, <laughs> right? Because that's that's where, you know, the Parasite is a Korean movie and it it is a global movie. And, but it's also and the Oscars yeah. have a have a history of nom like it's not the first time an Asian movie has been nominated, but they have a history of nominating the Asian movies and somehow yeah. these movies were successful without acting because like yeah, Crouching course. Tigers actors were not recognized. And you know, in fact, Michelle should have been nominated 20 years ago for Crouching yes. Tiger, you know. She should have won 20 years ago. Right, exactly. No, no question. Yeah. Slum Dog was yeah. the best picture winner, won all won all the awards. Probably this is the movie that was the the most awarded, but none of the actors, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, last you know, Emperor, last, last like it's just a yeah. long line of movies yeah. that that yeah. don't recognize the actors. That was what's so fascinating about everything everywhere. I remember when Last Emperor was was happening. I think they actually had John Lone and Joan Chen as part of the ceremonies in some fashion, but it just it felt so obvious to me that they were going out of their way to basically celebrate everybody non-Asian associated with this oh, for sure. production that casts every Asian in the world. <laughs> There's also multiverse in which Jamie Lee's the only one who won from yeah, the Oh my Network, God. Right. We we flip <laughs> tables, we burn. But yeah, I mean, this is this is just that reality that we've kind of grown up embracing or accepting, not embracing, but accepting. And it is one. I mean, you know, I, I hate to use the movie just so persistently as a metaphor, but it is one. We talk about there is a universe in which, you know, <laughs> but we also talk about the reality that the Evelyn that we see in the actual movie, the protagonist that Michelle Yeoh plays is somebody who has been beaten down in so many ways by failure, by lack of, of ability to achieve any of the things that they they really set out to do despite the fact that they that that you know Evelyn has so many dreams and I mean look you know Asian Amer Americans are far from the only people who have been cut out of or left off the stage from the Oscars I would say that right now there's a serious conversation that Hollywood has to have with Latinx creators and and artists, because yes, there are a handful of people, again, much like with Bong Joon-ho and, and other and Asian films and Asian creators who get celebrated, who are people representing cultures outside of the United States. But all too frequently, I think, really notable and, and incredible films and performances from Latin performers in the United States, from, from you know Latino and Latina performers and creators do not get that kind of notice. So Oscars still ain't brown enough, that's for sure. One of the things actually I thought was really amazing about being there last night, and again, I'm not trying to flex. It was just like a <laughs> last minute, oh yeah, hey, would you like to come to this thing? I'm like, oh my God, I'm racing there right now. <laughs> was was that this was a crowd that from the very beginning, you know, Daniel Kwan had said, hey, no hate. We're not out there to to trash anybody else. We don't get if we don't get the awards that we're hoping to get it will not be because others do not deserve. It will be because, you know, and we deserve just as much, if not more. So, you know, there's that sense that people were were absolutely prepared to cheer and root for for the opportunity to, to watch this magic night without any kind of vitriol, you know, loving, loving your enemy, because that is <laughs> the only way you can unlock, <laughs> you know, right, so start putting guns. googly eyes on people. Well, that, you know, <laughs> exactly. I wanted to get to that, actually, because the one thing that that emerged from this award season, mm. a, aside from its, you know, this movie's, you know, juggernaut status, which again, was unpredicted, like no one thought yeah. 
that it would be the the monster that it ended up being. Mm-hmm. But that also elicited a bunch of vitriol to your point from the other side. Like yeah. there was there was this sense that because of you know like any any front runner gets backlash and mm-hmm. film twitter you know there was a definitely like a sense of uh vitriol coming out of film twitter that i was surprised by because again if you flash back to march of last year when this movie came out when it was still a small independent movie that was getting around word of mouth it was celebrated and as as all things are when it was put on a pedestal people wanted to knock it down you know mm-hmm. but i just like from your perspective as someone who's spoken to the Daniels, to Michelle, to Stephanie, to Key, in the mm-hmm. course of the movie's, you know, trajectory, like, where do you think elicited that kind of reaction? Because you're right, there are the passionate fans beyond just the Asian American community, because I think oh, yeah. there's there's a attachment we've placed on it, but there's like the film's fans writ large, mm-hmm. but but then the, the backlash to the backlash, you know what I'm saying? Like, where, where yeah. do you think that came from? I mean, as you pointed out, anybody who is seen as the front runner frequently has to to deal with and experience the challenges that come with it right the bigger you are the the more the the haters cluster right <laughs> but i i do think that the biggest gap i saw was in looking at the types of people who are complaining about this film being celebrated and the kinds of films that historically they may have embraced or elevated in the past. I mean, you had people out there who are looking at a a long career in many cases of, you know, championing work by white male indie directors, the the various Andersons of the world, (laughs) Wes's and Paul Thomas. You had people who were saying, oh, licorice pizza is brilliant, you know? And for those of us who have actually grown up watching those films and in many cases enjoying them, Right. But also recognizing that a Wes Anderson can make a film like Isle of Dogs, where he basically uses Japanese culture as a receptacle for every white actor that he can possibly squeeze into there while exceptionalizing and exoticizing an entire tradition in the service of the narrative that that he wants to make. Or when Paul Thomas Anderson can create a film that is supposed to be the sort of nostalgic look back at at adolescence and then just happen to shovel in some incredibly racist scenes for no reason, right? Well, you don't even have to rewind back. Like Todd Field's Tar movie, <laughs> oh, the, yeah. the, the, the one that was supposed to be the competitor. And I think a lot of film Twitter is pissed that didn't win anything last night. Like the whole last act of that movie is about how shitty it is to be in Asia when you're this celebrated composer, you know? I will I will 100% apologize, not really, for not having seen the movie, but I read about that controversy, obviously. <laughs> I mean, look, on a, honestly, we, we are in a world where you have people who are going to stand up for whatever. And I think that, you know, to a certain extent, vision, being visionary is a little bit self-indulgent. It means that you sometimes have to actually stick true to uh, a narrative, a theme, a, a view of the world, which is going to feel alienating to some people because that's what happens. You slide hard, dust gets kicked up. I do think that there is something functionally, at the very least, uh, self-centered, if not outright racist, about looking at everything everywhere all at once and somehow saying that it is lesser or or more trivial or, or less important than a lot of the films that have succeeded in the past, again, with directors of a very different hue. And th- this is where... I think uh, the triumph really does impact the big C culture. It's not just about us as Asian Americans saying, hey, maybe we can actually take up some space. Maybe we can actually have narratives that are celebrated and celebratory that aren't cliche, that aren't just, you know, oh, what immigrant death and misery can we actually elevate this time, right? It's also about the fact that those critics who who try to clap this movie have to recognize the industry pivoting and and saying, hey, these stories are are new and different because we've spent so much time telling the same old damn stories time after time after time. So there's money in them our hills. This is maybe the Hollywood's new gold mountain, you know, right? <laughs> well, we and, know how gold mountain turned water. out for the rest well, of us. So. This is true. <laughs> Let, let's just hope that we're the ones with the gold this time. <laughs> well, you know, and I think that's the other thing that, you know, some of the cr- criticism is, is like, say you like a Marvel movie without showing or whatever the, you know what I mean? And it's like, yeah. but that's, that kind of pisses me off. Too. I mean, this is the nerds of color after all. And it's like, yeah. We've been saying, like, where is the respect for genre movies? And that was the one thing I appreciated from Jamie Lee Curtis's 
speech was at like you know it is a landmark for asian americans it's a landmark for like films about the multiverse it's also a landmark for genre films right like it is a straight up sci-fi movie straight up sci-fi martial arts movie like the fact that that got the best pick the most awarded movie of all time is a sci-fi martial arts picture starring michelle yo like that is in itself amazing. It, it is. Uh, at the same time, I mean, it's not like people complain about Avatar, you know, right. having been nominated <laughs> like, for right, shit. Because it's, it's like, like, well, Top Gun should have won. It's like, what the fuck, you know, dude? Yeah, <laughs> seriously. It's like, look, honestly, furries get more respect than Asians historically. <laughs> but that's all good. I mean, we- I mean, last night, Cocaine Bear and, and the donkey from Banshees <laughs> was pretty prominent in the telecast. That's this true. is true. This is true. That's that's the next big uh, hurdle for Hollywood to actually. <laughs> <laughs> but but I, I think that uh, this this notion of there being a kind of a validation for genre film. Well, look, Shape of Water won this That's damn thing too. a couple. Of years I mean, ago. Return of the King was uh, also a huge yeah. winner at the at the. Yeah. I mean, what the fuck am I talking about? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, but but I, I I think the difference is that we those tend to be critically heralded with with kind of provenance that makes people feel like the genre has sort of trans you know transcended genre right it's it's sort of like when you you look at uh, asian food and it's, and people sort of say it's elevated asian food which means white people actually made it right there there's a sense in which elevated genre has always been embraced but genre that owns genre genre that leans into genre that has a tendency to to be seen as you know kid stuff unimportant not worthy of of really celebrating at that level and this movie is that. I mean, this this movie never shies away from its genre roots. It is at its core an action film, a martial arts film, a film with dumb sex jokes. Of, of, of you know, and and all of that is fine because it uses those tropes and conceits to carry a much deeper and and richer narrative than I think most people ascribe generally to genre films, even as genre films often do that. And for me. The, the thing I love most about Jamie Lee Curtis winning, as much as I felt like Stephanie Sue absolutely deserved her flowers, is when- Or Jamie, Angela Bassett talking about wow. genre movies. Oh my gosh, that meme. <laughs> she, but, you know, Angela Bassett, I think everybody wanted her to get hers and, and felt like she deserved hers for that role. But she did elevate that role, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Jamie Lee was just eating scream, you know, and, <laughs> and, and screaming. And, and that is what she's done in many other genre movies over the course of her career without any kind of shame and nor should we have shame. Right. So she actually said that in her acceptance speech, yeah. she wasn't saying, you know, Oh, this is, this is a, a triumph for uh, method actors everywhere. She's like, no man, you know, thank you for all of the low budget shitty, you know, shitty seeming movies and maybe shitty actually being movies that yeah. i've been well, in. have you seen some of those halloween movies they're not great <laughs> <laughs> that got me here because <laughs> right. you know what all love right we yeah. have to have that we need the sugar and we need you know the salt we need to have this these things to make an industry and let's not be too pretentious or too uh, precious let's not try to sweep that yeah precious that shit under the rug it is our rug it is it is what makes our industry what it is. So all love to that for sure. I mentioned it in the intro. You you're writing a book called The Golden Screen that is supposed to come out next year or later this year. And it comes out October 31st, you know? So so, <laughs> and so just for, for those who are not in the know, it's a it's a book essentially about the history of Asian American cinema. You you went to press already. Mm. The Oscars, I mean, you gotta have to somehow squeeze in an addendum because this is probably the most significant event in Asian American cinema. Right. This is true. Like, am I not wrong? <laughs> no, you're not wrong. I, I will say this. One of the things we what that I wanted to do with the book was not make it just about the history of our cinema, but really, in some ways, the history of us watching cinema as mm-hmm. Asian Americans. So it does include Asian films, does include Hollywood films that represent us, good, bad, and ugly. But I will say this. I knew from Jump that Everything Everywhere was going to be a pivotal moment, right? I, I leaned hard into that by going out of my way to basically, you know, all but sacrifice thirdborns if I had a third. <laughs> <laughs> and and I, I got Michelle Yeoh to write the foreword for this book. And, and Daniel Kwan is one of the people I interviewed for it because even the very first time I saw this movie, 
uh, at a, a press screening. I have never done this before. I stood up and cheered. I didn't do that for Crazy Rich Asians, right? I, I knew that this was a movie that was going to make it safe for weird Asians to be us. And that it it took this idea of representation and flipped it on its end. We weren't simply there to be there anymore. We're not, you know, Crazy Rich Asians was a landmark and a milestone and opened so many doors. Hell, fresh off the boat, which cast its main cast, including a certain son of mine, Hudson Yang. <laughs> Full disclosure, right? <laughs> Full disclosure. Uh, nine years to the day, right? You know, March 12th before before the awards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was awakened to the same realization this morning too. I when I when I logged on the social media, I learned that nine years ago today, Nerds of Color officially teamed up with 18 Million Rising to launch the AA Iron Fist campaign. <laughs> like what a different world we live in from that 2014 era where like, yes, yeah, fresh off the boat was on its way and and being like this landmark thing we were lamenting here in the nerd space about like oh if only we had an asian american superhero <laughs> right and i mean and and for those people listening who may not be familiar with myself and jeff even longer ago you and i connected on all over this this idea that like there aren't any asian superheroes asian american superheroes and that we created a book that's sitting behind you right now secret identities <laughs> based on that like conversation and again, the the landscape from 2009, or I guess when we had that conversation, 2006, Jesus fucking Christ, <laughs> to now, it is it is like it is a different universe, isn't it? It is a different universe, and again, it takes every single step, it takes every single you know milestone for us to get here, every domino following falling to get here, right? I would say that. A lot of the things that we've been a part of or that we've we've covered or otherwise observed at close distance have been part of getting to this moment. I also want to underscore that this is just the fucking beginning. I mean, yeah. you know, one of the things that really blew my mind and, and that I was so happy about was to see the the preview of American Born Chinese. Uh, appear right in the middle of the Oscars telecast. Now, of course, ABC is owned by Disney. Disney also is <laughs> making. Yeah. At least they Chinese. didn't they didn't announce it during the actual ceremony like they did another <laughs> Disney property. But we won't, <laughs> we won't get into the Little Mermaid trailer. Oh yes, that. Uh, but yes, uh, <laughs> Spawn Con the, the, in the middle of the Oscars. <laughs> but it's all good. All good. You know, I I, I also just love how the uh, the telecast happened to get Halle Bailey and Halle Berry. <laughs> Yeah. Well, but you know, again, the foresight of the Oscars producers, like, you know, you had the foresight to have Michelle write the forward. They had the foresight to have Halle Berry present Mm -hmm. the Oscar to Mm -hmm. Michelle Yeoh because she's the last time women of color won Best Actress. So in the 95 years, two women of color won Best Actress and, and they presented to each other. It was also kismet that Harrison Ford presented the Best Picture Oscar. And, and we had that great meme of Key and Harrison hugging on stage, which was nice too. So it was one of those things where it feels magical in part because of the the synchronicity of of moments like that. But again, you think back and you say, how do you get here from there? Well, you get here from there, making these moments so important, so momentous, so magical, in part because it has taken so fucking long to get here. Yeah. Right. The only reason why this is so magical, oh, look, you know, Harrison Ford presenting to Kihoi Kwan. Yes, that is beautiful. But it also underscores the fact that that was basically his last and first big role in Hollywood, right? I mean, he was in Goonies also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and they the people were saying, oh, why did he not thank Spielberg in his speech? It's like, well, he loves Spielberg. He'll always owe Spielberg. But Spielberg did not cast him in any movies for three decades, you know? <laughs> so there, there is a sense in which him thanking the people who actually stood by him during all this time, including Jeff Cohen, his entertainment lawyer and fellow Goonie, was the space, right? You, you thank your community. You thank your family. You thank the people who believed in you all along. These were the people who were being thanked by Daniels by Michelle and and by Kihoi Kwan. And yes, by Jamie Lee Curtis, because in a long period when no one took her seriously as an actress, it was the genre folks who put her on, on screen. So to me, this is not this is not just about, again, the milestones that got us here. And those milestones are critically important. It is also about the fact that those milestones happened in order to get us across this vast vacuum, right? Those are the things that got us across a giant, you know, ocean of disregard and invisibility and erasure. We we had to actually jump from stone to stone just to survive. And now, yeah, maybe we're in the, the other side, you know, the promised land. Now we're actually seeing that this is the beginning of a new story. Now 
there are possibilities that never were possible before, but never forget the people who had to actually swim when we were able to step in order to set those milestones down. And for me, James Hong being at that ceremony, 94 year old fucking James Hong finally got a star in the Hollywood Walk of Fame, finally being recognized for who he is, 94 years old, still doing action movies, right? <laughs> that guy, that guy is a guy who I wanted to see more of during the ceremony and more of for as long as we have him, let's be honest. I mean, he's basically the same age as the Oscars. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, oh and it's okay. I mean, I don't, I don't know if this is true or not, but I, I, I don't know that he's ever been in the ceremony before. Like, what, what, I, what opportunity would he have had in the last ninety-four years to be at the Oscars? So, it took him in his entire lifetime to get to that stage, and that's that was pretty awesome too. Ninety-four years young, just the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll wrap up soon. I, I did want to thank you because you have your own blockbuster podcast the the <laughs> called, they call us bruce but you came on this rinky dink one to share your oscar thoughts so i appreciate that for for those again listening who may not know your podcast or some of your work which is crazy if they're listening to this podcast they know who you are but just in case they don't how can they find your work including the the article you wrote about everything everywhere and and all of the things that you got going on. Yeah, no, thank you, Keith. So I, I co-host a podcast called They Call Us Bruce with Phil Yu, Angry Asian Man. You can find that at theycallusbruce.com, you know, on Libsyn, on wherever you find your podcasts, including this one. I co-wrote a, a book with Phil and with Phil Wong of Wang Fu called Rise, a Pop History of Asian America from the 90s to Now. And yeah, the golden screen is coming out from Hachette Books, October 31st. It feels as if it's the the book to have in your hands as you look back across this really magical year, at least fingers crossed that you will feel that way. <laughs> if you want to follow me on social media, I am on Twitter at Original Spin, Instagram as well, and on Mastodon at Original Spin at mas.to, mas.to. But thank you, Keith. It is it's always a pleasure to talk yeah, to you. And, of course. Yeah. I, and I think I'm in the golden screen unless I you got are cutting room you floor. So. <laughs> would never would would never cut you without letting you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate that. You can find me on Twitter at the real chow, the underscore real underscore chow, and on Instagram at real Keith Chow. Follow the Nerds of Color on all platforms at the Nerds of Color, and go to hardknockmedia.com to find this and all of the other podcasts in the Hard Knock Network. Give us a rating and a review if you do. Support us on patreoncom slash the Nerds of Color, and subscribe to our videos at youtube.com slash the nerds of color jeff yang we are living in the universe in which an asian american movie won seven fucking oscars not to not to won the best original song six asians took oscars home last night well one of them took three home so uh, that's <laughs> daniel's that hogging some of the oscars for everybody else but six asian oscar winners last night if you want to come back and, and do the math and see how many Asians have won in the history of the Oscars, then we can do the comparison, but it's a new day. It's a new day. It's a new world. Thank you so much, Keith.